prior to the um, starting at UConn in 2020, I was actually in Kingston, Jamaica, where I was born and raised, um, hence the very strong Caribbean affiliation. So I worked at the University of the West Indies, um, where my career was really um, cemented, to be quite honest with you. I was both a deputy dean for or faculty of humanities and education and a senior lecturer at the time for comparative and international higher education. And then the world kind of collapsed on March 13, 2020. Now, prior to that, I, in Jamaica, was teaching online. And given the dynamics of the Caribbean, in particular, the University of the West Indies um, had a, a teaching certification program for teacher educators, for pre-service and in-service teachers that cut across majority of our Anglo, Franco, Suriname was included, so all of the CARICOM countries, to be quite honest with you. So I had the privilege to teach students every single year on a digital format before it was a thing. <laughs> so, and I taught them in research methods of all courses, right? <laughs> So try teaching 103, 100 plus students um, in an online digital format, um, spanning different time zones, spanning different cultural contexts in particular. Absolutely one of the best times and exciting. I named that because the dynamics of doing um, inclusive work and inclusion work, it requires some of the key similar principles, and that's what I'm going to go over today. That irrespectful of what course content you teach, where in the world you teach it, there are some guiding grounded principles around inclusion. And I will target, of course, specific to the context, which is going to be within the classroom. And in this case, within the higher education classroom. So the assumption is that these are undergrad all the way to grad students that can benefit. I always center students in my discourse um, and the ways in which faculty engage the learn environment to make it inclusive. All right, so a couple of key content. My colleagues and I that have been doing this work, to be honest with you, I was we were just nominating one of our colleagues who started this work, Professor Frank Tewitt, who some of you may or may not know, um, because he actually did this, it's coming up on 20 years, the 20th anniversary of this type of work around inclusive pedagogy in higher education that focuses truly on all aspects of inclusion and diversity, but predominantly focusing on racially and ethnically minoritized communities within higher education. So over the years, Professor Tewitt, myself, Dr. Haynes, um, have constantly evolved and redeveloped inclusive pedagogy. And so it has become this really formidable inclusive approach that has a redemptive strategy that looks at uh, the varying social, physical, psychological, emotional needs of our students. And we address this from a systemic level. We always address it as well from the focus of the unit of analysis being the core student, but how are they experiencing the learning environment, right? And with shifting the lens from that direction, the responsibility to create an inclusive and en learning environment, should this be practiced, is not solely on the faculty. Um, it is also on the students as well in the, in the learning environment. And so critical and inclusive pedagogies describes this pedagogy of possibility. It's transformative in nature. It's equity and identity affirming. And this is where all our students get to learn at their highest level, right? So that's kind of the principles that are guiding this approach. Um, and then let's get to some of the nitty gritties. So what you're seeing on the external compass is going to be the original birth or birth child of Professor Tewitt's work, right? This was back at Harvard University in the United States. And this was, uh, you know, as I said, 20 years ago. And what he did was borrowed from predominantly elementary and secondary schooling techniques within inclusion and inclusion overall. 
and brought together this amalgamation of different concepts that would look to change um, the environment to be more inclusive. And there are five different key principles, the faculty-student interaction, what that dynamic really looks like, the sharing power, which I've often find across the globe is really difficult to do, especially for professors in the classroom who stand in front. The assumption that they hold all the knowledge, we disrupt that in our principles of work. We actually argue that our students come in with significant amount of knowledge. And when they are allowed to, they co-construct the learn environment. They help to shape the assessments. They help to shape the syllabus. We also talk about the fact that within borrowing from the sharing poll, our students can challenge us. Are we that removed from understanding what it was to be like a student that we fear to be challenged in the discourse, right? After all, academia is all about being constantly critiqued, constructively so, hopefully, in order for our work to be robust and rigorous. So within the classroom space, we invite our students to challenge our epistemologies, our ways of knowing. How do we know what we know? And that interaction is highly respectful, but absolutely challenging. It requires of us to come to the classroom space, identifying the persons in the room as equal co-constructors of knowledge, right? The last two are tools, and they anchor on what we know as various forms of research methods. And I'll give you examples. So one is the activation of student voice. This is where we do ask our students to really know how and when to utilize their voice for transformative change and activism, right? And we use their personal narratives in order to engage in this work. So oftentimes, for those of you in the space who know about um, aspects of critical race theory, will understand this word called counter narratives and how the counter narrative story is one of those key principles of sharing that critical race theory, we, we are pushing against what is the normative or what has been subjected in the scholarship as, as knowledge, right? And so counter narratives often require that we ask our students to write themselves within the analytical reflections, right? And they have a better core understanding of what they're reading, the jargon in academic versions of English or academic languages and literatures. When I came into the work, I actually added in the center of this work, critical consciousness, because I asked Professor Tewitt, for whom and for what, why are we doing this? If it's not for change, for activation of some social agent of change, then why are we doing this, right? Why are we creating these inclusive learning environments? So I was fortunate enough to develop a couple of scales that I tested in the Caribbean across these five principles with various indicators to look at whether or not where they measure in different ranges of critical consciousness. And since then have developed the work and we came out with a secondary version of this work in 2016 and that's that book actually right behind me, um, which was Professor Chewitt's take on or take on uh, I, inclusive pedagogy 2.0. And so it built on those five core principles, but added what we were doing in the classroom as the needs of our students changed. So that's really important. Who is in front of us matters, not who we wrote for 20 years ago. So we're constantly looking at our inclusive practices because inclusion has changed. The word diversity has changed, right? And so we recognize that to be static in the space actually is very exclusive. So we had to revamp, we had to adapt. And in that, we developed these core areas building from the first five. So there was intentional praxis, 
the voice and lived experiences, again, are core. And some of you will know this from the various literatures on epistemic violence, the ways in which knowledge um, in the global south or of the global south and their populations and communities are rendered on the peripheries of knowing, right? What we're saying is uh -uh, they need to be in the center of knowing. And this, by the way, is irrespectful of um, the discipline. We have inter interdisciplinary diverse content. Um, there is this assumption of the anti-oppressionist equity mindedness. We develop these environments that are identity affirming and socially just. So that when a student walks into a space, they know that they belong to that space, right? Oftentimes higher education has become a very exclusionary space and we've done a good job, I think, and I say that very sarcastically, within the educational sectors across the globe, um, in which education is sometimes threatening for students and hostile and harmful. And so when we are bridging those gaps, it's oftentimes the spaces that they are occupying where they don't feel like they belong in those um, institutions. To do this work, absolutely requires what we call courageous transparency and a resilient emotional labor of love. It is a lot easier to continue with the status quo. However, COVID has showed us that to continue with that, we further widen the racial equity gap in academic performances, which has occurred across the globe as well. All right, just a couple more slides and then I promise you, and I have a couple of questions for you to think about, especially as you think through um, the faculty members who might be in the space, right? So we went through the 2016 version of critical and inclusive pedagogy. And these are some of the questions that we typically will ask our faculty and or their students, to be quite honest with you, because we, uh, you know, we center the students in the learning process and in the development process. So the questions are, what influence does the faculty member's critical consciousness have on their faculty behavior? Now that's making a huge leap and assumption <laughs> that a faculty member understands their own critical consciousness, right? That they have done the self work in order to be able to articulate what that is. Um, how well does faculty behavior, so what they do, align with each of these core principles? And then we normally throw out if there's examples of these behaviors that either disrupt or re-inscribe inequitable structures within the, within the classroom space. So if you do an audit of a syllabus, are you seeing um, knowledge and are you seeing readings that reflect a diverse community within the environment, right? Are you seeing assessments? Are you seeing the ways in which the, the content is um, going, to going to make a more inclusive learning environment space? It is not easy work. It does require a, um, seeking out additional information and also working with colleagues such as this group to figure out how to do that work. So as you can imagine, we were doing this work um, prior to COVID and then COVID hit and the classroom dynamics change. And the questions that we often get when we are presenting this type of work around the globe is two questions. One, can this work be actually done in STEM classrooms? And two, can the work be done digitally online? So we have seen across the board, um, I teach a lot of quantitative based courses and I teach those online often or was grounded in doing that when I was in the Caribbean. And the outcomes about using this type of pedagogical practice, right? Now remember faculty members, they are hired and they're hired as experts in their field. They're not hired to teach. So the assumption is that a faculty member knows how to teach. That I always tell students on the first day of class, please dispel that whole myth. That is not true. <laughs> they did not receive their PhD in teaching often. They received their PhD in a particular discipline and they are, they are experts in that discipline. 
they're not necessarily experts in the art of pedagogy, right? So I do often tell students that please dispel that myth. Let's try and work and figure out how to how to understand that at its core. Um, and then once that has happened, we do go through some of the things to look for. So often a faculty member should have a teaching philosophy, something that grounds the ways in which they approach the classroom space. They approach their advisees, even if they're not in the classroom space and they are conducting research with, with students, anything to do with students, they should understand for whom and for what am I approaching this space with, right? And that's their philosophy, um, their pedagogical philosophy. So some of the benefits are academic diversity and civic. And we've absolutely seen the academic space, more levels of self-confidence, critical thinking, problem solving abilities, the ability to reason more critically. Uh, the students feel more included. There's more cultural awareness. Um, there's levels of fostering creativity within the academic space as well. And then the civic outcomes is the parts of engagement. My students often said to me over the past dozen years is that, you know, I've developed these scholar activists or practitioner activists, and they don't know what to do with that now. So how do they engage with that type of activism? So those are some of the benefits we've been able to track over the past um, number of years. And these are just some of the spaces that we have been able to write or work in or that I have been able to publish in um, on inclusion. And that's all I have for you this morning, besides you know, tons of answers to questions, right? <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Soren. That was a, a very, very rich uh, speech. I don't even know what's first to, to take out to, to further uh, build on. Um, there are so many principles and so many um, ideas and there's so much research being done that uh, I can only in, in, indeed advise people to go and read a book and, and, and start more uh, discussing these topics. But maybe one of the things to, to take out, what I really liked is... Um, that uh, teachers will reflect on their own teaching constantly because it's not because you figured it out 20 years ago that it's still the same today. As we all know, society is changing uh, um, gradually, but then there are, of course, things like COVID happening where you have more uh, a shock or an interruptive uh, development and just being very attentive as, as a teacher and constantly um, checking yourself and checking where you're at, that that's a... Uh, that would be a, a good start, maybe. So I'll just leave it for there, at, there and then we will uh, go on to uh, the next speaker who, um, well, the next speaker was going to speak on the digital uh, aspects because we wanted to counterbalance and look at it from, from the two angles. Unfortunately, this morning, our uh, speaker on the digital had to cancel due to um, very sad personal uh, reasons. Uh, so he, he will not be with us today. He shared some of his main messages with us. So I will just go over the messages. In no way I am a digital expert, but I will try to convey so we have some of his uh, ideas that we can take with us in the, uh, in the conversation. So his first message was to say that we are today in a very crucial moment of the digital inclusion uh, journey. In his understanding or in his 20 plus years of experience and following uh, the digital, he, he came to the conclusion that the digital divide in some way is diminishing, but that maybe the counterbalance of that is that the social divide uh, is widening. Um, and that there are some disruptive digital uh, developments. As we all know, it's a very hot topic. The chat GPT mm -hmm. is now one of the things that are, are discussed uh, very much. Um, and also uh, the observation that digital literacy is becoming a priority everywhere. We know the, the normal literacy, but then we see that digital literacy is really one of the aspects that is, uh, is becoming more and more, and more uh, crucial. Um, let's see whether this goes to the next. Um, a second message would be that in, in, in time, and especially due to COVID, that we have learned a lot. Um, I think, and 
what he says as well, and I think we can conclude the same thing, is that digitalization is here to stay um, and that we cannot shy away with, with, from it. We, we must handle it with care. We must really investigate it uh, and explore the whole digitalization. Um, with this come a lot of new opportunities, as we are, are all aware, I can see, uh, but also there are a lot of inequalities. Uh, that come with the whole um, digitalization, and I think in the COVID we can all agree that we have seen them uh, come about. And with that is that when you are digitally excluded, that that could be seen as a way of being socially uh, excluded. So that's one of uh, his main messages. The other thing is that by now we uh, know what needs to happen. Uh, digital inclusion can be seen as a very good investment, uh, that inclusive design must become the norm. Uh, and so we need more research on the digital literacies just to, to equip ourselves better for the future. And that in, in that sense, digital empowerment becomes a focal uh, point. And with that, also that we are not alone in this endeavor, uh, all around the world, people are uh, doing a lot of research with it, a lot of people are seeking um, ways of how to deal with, uh, with the digital so we can learn from one another in this uh, communal endeavor, so to say. So that's all I'm going to say about that, that's all more I've got for now. But do, I will pass on the floor to uh, Dr. Marike Slootman. She uh, is uh, the coordinator of our uh, in inclusion project and I will just hand the floor to her and she can uh, Yes, please. My presentation. Yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm trying to find between all these fancy screens in this room to see where, my, where I can see, where I can actually look at you, audience. <laughs> I see myself there, but I also see you there. Um, my name is Marike Slootman. I'm the project leader of the e-inclusion project. I'm working at, uh, currently working at the uh, View University and at, in Holland. Um, I have to say that with the previous speaker, you were actually uh, explaining, uh, um, Katia, I was Fabio Lanskambini, did I say it right? And I also have to say that, uh, sorry, uh, Serena, uh, I think I disturbed you with recording exactly at the moment when you started speaking. Uh, we wanted to record the plenary part of this uh, of this conference. We will not uh, um, record the, the second part of the day because we want the participants to contribute, participate, and feel safe to share uh, personal experiences. So um, we want to uh, to record the, the plenary session, but don't be afraid when we ask you to participate or you can share your experiences. Will we not record the uh, the input of the audience? Um, my colleagues, no. My presentation is there. I'm sharing it. It's going to be shared to yeah. you too. Oh, I don't believe it's get on a equipment. No worries. Um the coming 15 minutes, I will tell you everything about our e-inclusion project, its tools and its findings. Um and as Katya already, or actually Oh yes, and as the as the film introduced, but you could not get all the all the details of the film, unfortunately, because the subtitles were scrambled a bit. So uh, I think everybody of the audience could hear a part, or could understand part of our uh, question. But um, is it shared already? No. Yes. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's see if my. Work. Yeah, so the e-inclusion project, it was co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program and consisted of uh, various partners with all different expertises throughout of Europe. So the Catholic University of Lublin, the Open University of Catalonia, Knowledge Innovation Center from Malta, uh, Hasselt University, uh, Belgium, and from the, from the Netherlands, we had the Diversity Expertise Center, ECHO, and the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. Um, well, let's dive into this inclusive digital education. And uh, um, Dr. Stewart, you, you give us a nice introduction or a very in-depth analysis already of what you encounter. Um, so what do we mean with uh, inclusive education? Well, set the scene. 
inclusive education for us is accessible as education that is accessible and engaging for everybody regardless of social background identities and disabilities digital education is education that makes use of digital tools so it can be fully online education as we experienced during COVID, but also blended education as it's now used today or hybrid education as we're actually doing now with some people here and some people uh, 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 with virtual participation. Um, so what's the problem? Well, I think you wouldn't be here uh, when you wouldn't experience some friction sometimes with regard to education. But we all know that digital education, as Dr. Stewart explains, is not accessible and engaging for everybody. Not in not the same way. Uh, not everybody experiences education in the same way. Not students but also not teachers. Uh, for some students and teachers, so you like, there are barriers in education. For some students and teachers, their bodily and neurological functionalities do not allow them to access spaces or participate in education in the same way. Um, some students have financial or care responsibilities uh, that complicate their studies. Some study, some students lack role models, they lack support or information that other students do have. Um, some experience discrimination and microaggressions, where they simply feel they do not belong because their talents are just to talk on. I think you yeah. you stopped. Doesn't yeah. matter. <laughs> because uh, some some students feel they don't belong because their talents are not acknowledged. Um, they don't have an exact feel for the ways of working, of communication. Um, they don't see uh, their experiences reflected in cases or examples in the, in, the, in the books or in the classes, or because the content does not resonate with their perspective of world, world views. So for people... And you? Uh, yeah, you, can you still hear me? Everything is gone. People saying in chat, everything is gone. I don't hear anymore. It's back. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so these barriers, I, I hope you followed a bit about my explanation about these barriers in education, which was part of this slides. No, I can't move my slides. Um, so we had a lot of uh, barriers already in traditional kinds of education. But in the corona pandemic, with its switch to online education, we encountered a few more. Um, I encountered more uh, um, uh, barriers, or let's say different barriers. Because at first, let's speak from my experience, when we moved to online education during corona, I was uh, quite surprised. We could do it. We could do it in a couple of days or, or a couple of weeks. It was even more efficient than we uh, than we than we were used to do, so it wasn't all that bad until we started. Yes, that's the right slide. I don't know. You can see it, but I can see my right slide here. <laughs> okay. Until we started to miss personal contact, we um, um, we missed engagement. We missed motivation. We missed a student and teachers, they both felt anom anonymous and students fell, fell out or they didn't fill out, but they put their screens in black and we teachers were teaching before black screens. Um, participation reduced. At the same time, open universities actually have always uh, or, or for years have, have used this online teaching to actually uh, create inclusive education open for everybody uh, and to uh, and to also make it engaging. So, what's my next? Next year. But this teaches us that our COVID experience, first of all, are not representative for online teaching. It was representative for emergency remote teaching, replacing our uh, traditional education into virtual contact. That doesn't work. 
So what we need is purposeful educational design, uh, which makes intentional use of digital tools for inclusion. And that requires that teachers and the teachers are aware of the opportunities and risks that the use of technology brings for inclusion and exclusion. So that's what we did in our project. Um, digital education needs to be inclusive by design, and you need certain knowledge for that. And we used, uh, we built on the famous TPAC model, and we say that to design inclusive digital education, you need four interrelated knowledges. One, content. Knowledge about the content. Knowledge about the pedagogical aspects of teaching. Third, knowledge about technology. That's TPEC. But we will also say to build inclusive digital teaching, we need more knowledge. We need knowledge of how content, technology, and pedagogy affects inclusion and actually or shapes inclusion and exclusion for students and teachers. So we advocates to add another layer of knowledge, inclusion, equity, knowledge. And in the inclusion project, we have compiled and developed this inclusion knowledge. For example, it's important to understand how the use of digital tools in education shapes inclusion. It provides or it, it, it arises uh, new, uh, it gives new challenges, but also specific opportunities. First of all, on the challenge side in digital education, as we all have experienced, it's pretty hard. You need to do much more conscious effort to build social presence, to establish social presence, to get to know each other and establish a safe learning and inclusive learning atmosphere. Secondly, we have digital barriers, with additional barriers. Uh, so for students and teachers who are less secure or have less, less knowledge about technology, uh, it's not easy to participate and to actually create uh, uh, high quality education. Um, but also for those with uh, bad techn technological equipment or bad internet net connections, it's harder to participate and thrive. At the same time, this use of digital tools allows for much more flexibility in time and space, allowing for many more to participate. Um, it allows for endless diversification in formats, uh, like, um, where are my notes? Here, text, video, uh, audio, uh, different languages, use of subtitles, and diversification is an important uh, principle to design inclusive uh, uh, education. It's called universal design for learning. And thirdly, Digital tools allow for many possibilities for activation and co-creation, so actually stimulating the student voice that um, uh, Dr. Soran uh, Stewart was talking about. So based on this compiled uh, inclusion knowledge in relation to pedagogy, content and technology, we have formulated several guidelines uh, on how to make teaching more inclusive. We directed it at teachers, but it's also uh, very important for uh, knowledge for institutions and, and those who uh, support teaching uh, uh, and education. I want to say one thing, it's not a checklist. So uh, creating inclusive education is not about doing stuff and then you achieved it. It's a practice, a practice that you need to uh, to shape every day, and you do so in interaction with your students, with the content, and with your mood at the moment, and also with you as a person, because teachers are not distant, neutral people. They're uh, actually persons with positionalities. We position these guidelines within this pedagogical triangle of teacher, student, and content. And the first guideline is for the teacher to develop awareness about your own uh, biases and assumptions and how this affects your digital inclusive teaching. Secondly, we uh, argue that teachers need to get the no to know the students and their previous knowledge, their stances, and their needs, including their digital competences and needs. Thirdly, we advocate to diversify teaching practices. Uh, seizing the many opportunities that technolog technology offers. Fourth is to diversify content, also using these online possibilities to find resources out, resources out this, this, this common, uh, uh, this mainstream canon in terms of region, language, formats, um, 
and it enables the students to be co-creators of the course and also come with content that you as a teacher would never thought about. Fifth, we have six, so I'm nearly there. Mm -hmm. um, the fifth is to create an inclusive digital learning climate with student engagement, uh, with inclusive language and images, and with purposeful approaches to establish this social, uh, this, this social presence so everybody feels safe. And there is uh, a room for every uh, student for their voices. And uh, as mentioned before, no, this is quite a bit. You cannot do this alone. Well, you can, but it's quite tiring and quite uh, limited. So collaborate. Find colleagues that you can share uh, your, your ideas, maybe your, your, your needs and frustrations. You can share this burden of burden, this, um, this yeah. challenge of getting to know what is inclusion mean, but also what do we need of the digital worlds to teach? Uh, and also to align courses within your program. This brings me to the last two slides. Um, this is this knowledge we developed is made accessible in several ways for those who like to read. There must be some in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> we have a handbook. Uh, we also developed e-learning modules for those who want to read smaller bits of text, uh, watch uh, watch videos. Uh, we compile the whole set. Uh, and um, uh, be triggered by some, some learning activities for yourself. So this is actually for teachers who want to, to explore um, uh, yeah, on hand. No, that's not English. To explore and to learn how to make their teaching more inclusive. Uh, we are working on an awareness raising tool and we developed an e-inclusion course that we piloted last autumn at the University of Catalonia. Uh, and, the, and the course design will be open access, uh, accessible on the website soon for those uh, institutions who actually want to uh, prepare a course for their teachers or to be teachers, future teachers, uh, on how to, uh, to give inclusive digital education. Um, my last slide contains an impression of how the guidelines are detailed in the handbook and the e-learning modules that I mean, this is quite a high level of explanation, uh, but we work them out with all kinds of tips that you can try to uh, to mold into your own courses or help your colleagues with and start trying tomorrow. Uh, and you're very welcome to visit them uh, on the website. I want to thank you for your attention. I think we go to the panel now. That's yeah. Sharing. Stop sharing, please. Thank you, Marika. <laughs> okay. So we are very happy that you are here. We know that you have some experience in the inclusion, in the digital, in the trying to merge the two uh, together. So the floor is open or the chat box is open. Let me put it that way to maybe um, share some uh, questions or maybe some remarks. Maybe there's something that uh, you thought was very interesting in one of the keynote speeches and you want to elaborate on that. So we would like to hear uh, from you. Um, so please share your thoughts in the in the chat and we can uh, pick up your question and maybe address them to Marika or Seren or someone else from our uh, team. But maybe uh, one question to get started uh, to you, Seren, if I may. Sure. Um, so you, you, your expertise is mainly uh, the, the inclusion aspect. Uh, you've done a lot of research on it. Uh, but of course, as you mentioned, you, you taught a lot in the, in the digital environment as well. So just from your point of view, um, what would be the biggest challenge or maybe the biggest opportunity when you look at the digital uh, to advance uh, inclusion or what could be the biggest barrier? Maybe uh, elaborate on that if, if that's okay for you. Absolutely. So I think one of the biggest challenges from experience um, pre and during COVID and currently right now teaching in these different modalities, you know, it's the engagement piece. So I am a, a big mixed methods um, faculty. And so, but I worked with when my qualitative brain turns on, 
I do look at the body language of my students, right? To see what topics are disengaging, what topics are really engaging, where are they in that space? And that is hard to do in, a, in an e-environment, right? It is hard. It takes a lot of different um, tips and tricks to break up the monotony of a course. And I typically taught three-hour courses. <laughs> so that's not easy on an e-environment. So what I would do is when I have a large class, anything over 75 students, that's going to be on an e-environment, I would absolutely have TA, so teaching assistants in the room with me. Um, that would be on the platform. I would engage, you know, I plan all my lessons. I have something that's called a facilitation guideline mapping sheet for each segment of my lesson. And I know from learning sciences, so the discipline of the science of learning, when a student typically, you know, gets distracted and tunes out. So I'm constantly mapping out my lessons and then doing small group interaction, as well as creating different lessons using various platforms. So I'm seeing what they're writing, when they're writing, we're having all group discussions, stuff like that. So it's not just me talking in a screen. The students have to talk back at me. <laughs> so I'm constantly having these learning checks, right? That but I'm developing these mapping tools in order to be like, okay, I'm teaching you this. And then I want you to go into your small group to see what you actually learned. And then I want you to write out what you learned or type out what you learned. And then we're gonna talk about what we learned so that when we know that we're in a space together, I would have tapped into each of my students' learning styles by having a variety mixed into the classroom. So I'm taking that and then moving it into an online platform. So I will say that's one huge challenge is engagement and keeping them engaged. The other piece with inclusion though, which I didn't touch on, is when we get to hot moments in our classroom space. Those are those hot moments that it's hard to do in an online space because you might have to stop the classroom. You have to stop the learning because learning stopped happening. During hot moment times are when there is something that has occurred in the classroom space. Someone has said something. We've, we've come across a triggering um, reading or topic area. We've presented a data that is representative of a person's communities and lived experiences, but now it's on a screen and it's hurtful, right? So when that happens, it's important to check in with your students. And again, having those smaller breakout room classes, right? Um, doing those different types of check-ins gets you to see where there might be hot moments, but not all the time. <clears throat> so being somewhat, I won't say I'm fully seasoned, but doing this for over a decade, I do understand which topic areas might be that hot moment and bring it in. So I hold space for those times to happen. That's not always easy for someone who may not necessarily be aware, critically self-aware of how, where their students are coming from, what the context is and the content and how it can be um, disruptive to their learning, right? And so it's important to constantly have those check-ins. I think the opportunities that come from e-learning is having these ver variations of what I would consider um, these digital archives to present, represent to the students to save their learning, right? So I do an activity that's called Chalk Talks in my class. It lets me know who's reading in my class as well without, <laughs> without like signaling in any of the students. Chalk Talks is where I give time for a student to select their favorite quotations from the readings. And they select them based on whether or not they disagree completely, they think it's garbage, or whether or not they're like, you know what, this was my favorite quote and this is why. On the e-platform, I allow them to also do that um, um, using some of the Google um, software tools and I'm able to save it and then they can map with each other and it becomes really interactive. I use Jamboard in, on Google for that. 
when I'm face to face, I lose some of that information because I have them do post-its and stickers and, you know, that's a lot of paper. So please throw that away. <laughs> um, but on Jamboard, it's an archive. So I'm able to reuse that with other classes as exemplaries to have the students learn um, and learn from their cohorts before. And it helps with my pedagogy. What worked? What didn't work? What do I need to change for the next cohort? So, it's a, so the digital environment provides us with a digital pedagogical archive for us as faculty to be like, you know what, this didn't work well with the students. I need to change this. I need to relook at engaging with them. So there are different ways um, that I think there's opportunities, absolutely, but there are other challenges that we need to be able to anticipate um, from a pedagogical standpoint. I hope that helps. <laughs> Thank you very much. I see there are some questions uh, addressed to you as well, uh, Siren. I'll just uh, read one question. Uh, what are your ideas around methods for student evaluations to get feedback from students about the course content and teaching and learning methods? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's a great one. I mean, so keep in mind that the first assumption is that I like my students' voices, even the ones that have pure dissent, right? So at the end of my courses, my students will get a little um, index card about this big or a post-it. And there are three questions at the end of every class, not mid-semester, not in the middle of the term, every class anonymously. And they will either type if it's online or they will write, right? And the questions are three questions, basic three questions. What stood out for you in this class? What still remains confusing for you in this class? And the last question, what questions did you wish that you had asked but you didn't ask for whatever reason? That then is taken because I spent another hour after class. I mean, not, not the same night, because I'm exhausted. I have class <laughs> tonight. <laughs> I'm exhausted. The next day, I process all of those questions. And guess what I'm checking for? I'm checking for all the hot moments <laughs> that I'm anticipating. Where did I, you know, how did I not meet the students' needs? What's going on? And so I check for what's happening in the classroom space, or I have my TA help me with the check-in of it. And... We, we start off the discussion about what to spend the first 15 minutes in in class. And typically those 15 minutes debrief their evaluations the evening off. So what I'm saying to you is that I don't, I appreciate the university summative evaluations, but I need to know what's happening in my classroom every single day. And there are students that, um, you you will need to reach in a different way. And the, one of the ways I've been able to try to get to every student is that they're able to tell me what's working for you. My style is not for everyone and that's okay. So how do I get you to learn with a different style, right? So the only way I can know that is that I'm inviting my students to speak to me. Some are going to be willing to have a consultation but some find it in that moment to tell you this topic was too hard. I understood nothing <laughs> that you covered. I need you to go over everything. Or this was the best thing I've experienced. Can you elaborate it on it next week's class or the next class? So um, I think formative forms of um, evaluation, just small little nuggets, they are powerful in making sure your climate of your classroom stays even. That's what you want to make sure. You don't want to wait until eight weeks have gone into the semester and then you're like, what happened? Why are you not engaging with the readings? You know, well, they may have missed the first four weeks that it could completely didn't understand what was happening and they're lost. So I try to do that um, in every class, every single class. That's a, that's a great tip, and I can imagine that asks a lot of, uh, of engagement from your part as well to, yeah. to really be there with your students and, and feel who they are and, and where they are at and how you can take them to the, to the next step. So uh, that's uh, 
That's great. I'm looking at the, the chat box. Uh, what makes inclusion challenging is that inclusive practices face to face become inclusive design practices when learning is mediated through technology. So in addition to the inclusive discourse while teaching, inclusive practices need to be designed baked into the learning uh, environment. That's a, that's a great remark that we uh, take with us. And I see it got a, that's a nice uh, digital interaction. There's someone second, uh, seconding the, 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 the statement. So that's great. A uh, great way to engage with one another from a distance. Uh, a question to, um, to our very own Marika um, uh, about guideline two, get to know your student. Do you have specific advice for teachers with large groups? Yeah, I think those uh, large groups are extra challenging. Um, uh, we do have advice in, in, the, in the book. Also, we, we, we give some. I think there you need to split getting to know the particular needs of your students and getting to know one another. Because I do think to get to know one another, smaller groups are, are better to open up. So for students to get to know one another, I think it's important to work uh, uh, at least in synchronous, in synchronous sessions in smaller groups. So smaller breakout groups like we do today uh, are safer. But we also used uh, NICE uh, in, in the... Um, uh, I'm looking at my colleague, <laughs> who was uh, who was part of the of the course. We uh, yeah, I'm looking at my colleague who was part of the course that we taught. Uh, there we used, uh, but also in smaller groups of twenty, we had platforms where the students had to tape uh, their their own, their own small introductory videos, which was way out of their comfort zone. But therefore, uh, I taught them a lot. Um, but for uh, to actually uh, uh, inventorize more particular specific needs, the, 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 on the chat they call Mentimeter. So you have various tools actually to collect uh, anonymously or well, anonymously. There could also be handy for for to know what the group needs uh, to to collect uh, expectations, needs. So you can use various digital tools to collect inputs in the same way that um, that. Uh, uh, Dr. Stewart just, just said, uh, I want to say something more. That's, I forgot. <laughs> that's oh, a, yeah, I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to say one thing. I think it's important, and that's a, a, a big difference in the, in, in the digital sphere and in the in-person sphere, um, uh, is that it's important um, that you arrange the informal time. Because uh, usually a lot of the, the social presence or getting to know each other occurs when you're going for coffee or you have a chat after class or before class. Uh, and in the digital uh, uh, educational environment, that often does not occur. Um, so uh, when you arrange a, a time that you students can see you informally or you come earlier or, or um, start, uh, stay later, it's a bit of a buzz around me, which is a little bit distracting. But uh, so try to, to arrange informal time with your students. That also will help in getting to know your students. But it needs more uh, uh, thought. And that's also what struck, struck, me, struck me, actually, in what, uh, in what Dr. Stewart said, is the, the preparation that goes into digital teaching. It's often, we often make it appear that we, it takes us less time. It takes just much more time because you need much more detailed instructions and much more detailed plan about what we know. We also uh, experienced that for, for our course, but also for the workshops of today. So, um, yeah, it's, it's not a, a way to save time, actually, to go in. That brings me to uh, another question, maybe the last one, because I'm, I want to be mindful of the time as well. Uh, that's the, the, the statement that we often uh, feel that we need to improve students' digital skills. Um, and so the question is, are digital skills truly the problem? And if they are, to what extent compared to the organizational aspect of the digital learning environment? I think that feeds into what you were just saying, Marika, that um, there's one part of it that's a digital, um, the digital skills of students and teachers, but next to that also, what does it ask on an organizational 
uh, scale to um, well system wide, but also like the institution, but definitely the learning environment. Is there any comment? I don't know, Seren. I'm checking in with you. Any comment on that? Or reframe the question because I was trying to find it just so yeah so it's about uh is it uh is the digital skills is that is that merely the problem or should we more be concerned about the organization of the digital learning environment yeah you know I always take it back to the learning environment I'll be honest no I say that knowing that again I I, I can't reiterate it my I have four different degrees, right? And then I've become specialized in a couple of different areas. Thankfully, one of those degrees was in education, right? And our own pedagogy. Otherwise, we're not trained to teach this. A chemist is not trained to teach chemistry. A chemist is trained to, and, and I know this because my sister-in-law is an inorganic chemist and she's hilarious, right? When she sees all the things that I'm doing with her classes, she's like, I wasn't, I, didn't, I worked in chemistry because I didn't want to work with humans, <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> and it's, it's hilarious because it's true. So what that means is that, yes, for us in front of the classroom, it is incumbent on us to tool up, to skill up ourselves on the various things and not, not, don't, not to get overwhelmed though but to really understand what are some key tools, and I love how this is being presented, right? And skills that I can utilize in order to do what I do best with regards to learning. So understanding those pieces. And then you, you work at it, you optimize, and you practice. I love, Marika, when you said, this is not a toolkit. It is not a checkbox. This is praxis. It is, you have to train, you have to set your mind up. It's almost like I've been on this health kick, pray for me, because I missed this morning. So I went yesterday to the gym, right? And you're trying to be stronger, right? I want to get to lift, say, 45 pounds in benching, right? I can't go tomorrow to my coach and be like, let me lift 35 pounds or, you know, I think it's 20 kilograms. No, I cannot. <laughs> um, so you need to train every day to become stronger. The art of teaching is very similar to that. You have big, you have, have to train to do this. I was going to show you a photo for some of my visual learners that might appreciate this just a little bit. So I promise Katya, I won't take too much time on this. Don't worry, don't worry, go ahead. <laughs> but this is one of our jam board that I was trying to explain, right? Each of these post-its is essentially another student or a group of other students. And the ways in which I, you know, broke out the piece was it was originally, they have four myths and this is about their reading, right? And I'm asking them to, you know, deconstruct the myth. I'm all about the myth of what we're reading, right? Because remember, I go into this thing of, no, 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 not because it's written or published doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> you need to argue these myths, right? So they're deconstructing this learning and we're practicing. So you see all the highs. None of my students love Jamboard. In fact, they said, I don't like it, Dr. Stewart, right? So I said, okay, no problem. So we started doing some small little high fives. So I just had them type out little things just to, you know, dispel some of their jitters around doing this. Then as they start to get into it, I started to show them, hey, smiley face. Now I want you that you've already put in your myths. I do want you to now connect with your classmate. See what they wrote. Do you agree or disagree? Draw arrows. Draw little icons that make you think that, you know, this makes sense, right? So you see a little bit of the LOLs, a little LOL. It's just a wannabe smiley face in the middle. And you see a ton of different um, arrows. The exclamation points are where they were like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Yes, I agree, right? So we were talking about like, you know, student debt and um, the high rises in student debt. And they were pulling out salient quotes. We are a middle-class nation. Who is we? so much erasure in this statement. So they were engaging. And I have them do this individually because they're all on their own computers, silently as well. Because there's a process of learning that happens in different, different modes, right? And modalities. But when they just started, they were not happy with me. 
you know, hence why, oh, hi, hello, hi, you know? So I named that because, or we should not assume that our students are going to want this. That's our, that's a fallacy. Students don't want this, not often at least. But how do you engage with them in the process? Break down the jitter so they don't feel more embarrassed. And then you start to say, hey, can you highlight this? Can you read your other classmates? Bridge connections, right? So they do some individual learning, then they went back into group learning, then they saw all the richness of the data coming through. And it is data points, right? So I use that as an example because I, you, you should try to develop a couple of core skills and then you need to strengthen them. You need to work on them, finesse them, learn more, and then, and then figure out how am I engaging with them? Don't throw a whole bunch of tricks <laughs> into the pot. It will become very overwhelming. But how can we engage little tweaks in it, start small and then develop? So I love the fact that this project provides you with a number of tools and skill sets to do exactly that. And then you bring it with your students one by one. Let's start small and then let's um, amp up the digital platform. So That's uh, great, Saren. Thank you very much because that opens the door to the introduction of our uh, uh, workshops that we have created for uh, this afternoon. We have tried with all the guidelines that we have come up with and all the principles to create three different uh, workshops where we use different uh, digital platforms, where we want to engage you as a participant in, in a way um, that you can feel, feel part of the process and where you can learn from one another. So it's exciting for us as well. So let's hope uh, that you, uh, you are enjoying it. So we welcome you to come back at a quarter to one, uh, because then we will uh, start uh, putting everyone in breakout groups so that we can start with uh, the workshops. Uh, if you don't remember what workshop you signed up for, don't worry, just join us uh, at a quarter to one and we will we will take it uh, from there. But for now, I wish you a very nice lunch and I hope to see you in one of our next uh, workshops. Thank you so much.